All right, we're going to open up in prayer. It's 636, so we're just going to get started. And as the fine folks come in the back, Mary, if uh, you'll just field them, and then we'll go on from there. Sweet. Huh? Check in. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Hit them low. Sever life for every minute That's brutal. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Let me make sure I'm also recording the audio just so I don't screw everything up. Heavenly Father, we bless and praise your holy and sacred name. We thank you for the gift of these marriages that are coming before you, Lord. We ask that you bless all of us um, and that our marriages may truly be in the sign and image of the covenant that you have with us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, your son. Come Holy Spirit, come reign in our hearts, come reign in this conversation and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, O Lord, and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Jesus, in your matchless name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A uh, little uh, introduction. So basically how today is going to work is in the past, when we would hold convalidation preparation, we would treat y'all as if you were newlywed 20-somethings and you didn't have all these years and life experience and stuff like that. So then I got Mary, and Mary is like a dog with a bone when she doesn't like something, when something irritates her. So she was like, we have people who've been married for 20 years, five years, 10 years. Why are we putting them with newlyweds when they're talking about floral arrangements and uh, music and stuff? When we can just focus on the sacramental dignity and the biblical theology of what it means to be married and prepare people to convalidate their marriage. Now, the understanding of, so I'm all about getting rid of red tape. Uh, inclusion, which is a program, you know was uh, started because there was so much red tape around the wrong audience, which is baptized Christians. They were being thrown in with the unbaptized. And so it's like, no, that's not what the church asks of us. So what we want to do is create a simple approach, a classroom model for y'all to come and just work through what the church teaches. So what you have in your hand, part one, is what we're going to cover today. This is what the church teaches regarding marriage, the divine role of marriage and family. This is important. We want to lay out the biblical theology. You might know a lot of this or most of this or all of it. Great. We just want to be on the same page. So I went through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. If you're not familiar with that, the Universal Catechism of the Catholic Church was published in 1992 to kind of be a summary of teachings of the church. Nothing that you hear from me today, when I quote these paragraph numbers like you see right here on the first page, it says, uh, paragraph 1602, it has the heading, Marriage and God's Plan. That's not my descriptor or heading. That is the paragraph number 1602, where you can crack open the catechism, go to the third part, which is on Christian morality, and look up, or no, that, that part comes to the second part on the sacrament of marriage, and it has all this stuff listed about the dignity of the sacrament of marriage. Um, I also, as we go through, I jump around all over the catechism to drive home and gather all the teachings of marriage and family, and to put it in one organized place for the next three weeks. At the end of the three weeks, we do basically two classes or two hours within each meeting. We cover the broad kind of content of, um, of what you would do in the previous class where you were there in a classroom for six and a half to eight hours. So I'm a nerd. I'm scared of a six and a half to eight hour in one shot Saturday class. So we decided to spread this out in order to make it not as horrific. So um, what is convalidation? There are a lot of um, cultures that do not accept Christian weddings. So for instance, when a priest marries a couple in Mexico, it doesn't matter in the eyes of the state. It does matter in the eyes of God, but not in the eyes of the state. The state, since the 1920s or 30s, has rendered invalid all uh, ecclesial weddings, right? You're not married unless you're married uh, in the eyes of the state. Um, hello, welcome, welcome, come on in. And, and so a lot of people who are coming from Mexico here at our parish have to go through this convalidation process because they had no clue that there was, no, that their marriage, or some of them had no clue that their marriage wasn't blessed in the church. When I say blessed in the church, what I mean by that is married in the eyes of God. If you're a baptized Catholic, you are expected to be married in the church. That's a sacramental marriage. Now, marriage has evolved over time, how it's performed. Um, you can sit anyway. It's okay. Have a seat. Have a seat. Uh, marriage has evolved over time and how it's performed, the ceremonies, the rites, the cultural customs that are around it. But Christian marriage and its meaning, its essential meaning, has endured 
down through the centuries, all the way from the time of Christ. And so what we're going to do is kind of walk through that understanding of what that means. So, um, and like I said, basically what we're going to do is we're going to go over this and I'm going to provide my amazing color commentary on the catechism of the Catholic Church. And at the end of it, you'll say, wow, that changed my life. It was amazing. And uh, I'll say, yeah, no kidding. That's why we charge so much. So um, we are going to begin understanding sacred scripture. Okay, this is the most important. 1602, sacred scripture begins with the creation of man and woman in the image and likeness of God. And it concludes with the vision of the marriage feast or wedding feast of the Lamb. The reason why this is so important for us to understand is that the entire Bible, which Biblia, meaning collection of books, that spans thousands of years if you go to the oral traditions, written traditions, about 15, 1800 years from beginning to end. It's pretty incredible, written by a diverse group of people, some mostly men, some women, editors, and all this stuff that finally composed what we call the Bible or collection of books or library. Um, throughout is this notion of covenant, and the covenant is expressed through primarily two images, a father's relationship to his son and a husband's relationship to his wife. And vice versa. And the reason why this is important is God in history chose a people, Israel, to have his covenant and begin his saving plan with. From the very beginning, God chose his people, Israel, and from that he always expressed himself in two ways. I am a father to the nation of Israel, or I am the bridegroom. We don't really use that term any longer. We just say groom, but the bridegroom to my bride, and Israel is my bride. Scripture uses, and this is the thing that we have to hammer into our skulls throughout this whole process. Your marriage is an image, a sacramental, a sign that points to the greater reality of God's relationship with you as an individual and you, meaning the church. So the reason why the church safeguards, defends, even politically, the notion of marriage, and we're going to go through all that stuff as we as in the three weeks, the reason why it does is because a marriage points to something greater than just two people arranging a domestic partnership and uniting their financial obligations, right? It is a sacramental sign that unites two people in an everlasting covenant or that points to the everlasting covenant that God wants to have with us, right? So we're going to go through that. Scripture speaks throughout of marriage and its mystery, its institution and the meaning God has given it, its origin and its end, meaning its goal or its purpose. It's various realizations. Howdy, howdy, come on in. No, you're good, you're good. It's various realizations throughout the history of salvation, the difficulties arising from sin and its renewal in the Lord and the new covenant of Christ and the church. Now, let me make one thing really, really loud and proud here at the beginning. I love the sound of my own voice. I talk a lot. Uh, feel free to interrupt me. Feel free to, you know, questions, whatever you might have. Because I believe that a, a questioning mind is not a lack of faith and a sign that you take the stuff seriously. So I welcome all of that stuff. So first we ground ourselves in 1602. Marriage is a sign of what God intends for all of us. This is the height of Christian revelation. So now we, what the, what the catechism does is it breaks down into basically four stages. How do we view marriage through scripture? Number one is the order of creation before sin. Number two is the regime of sin. Number three is God through the pedagogy or the teacher of the law. And number four is how Christ comes in the fullness of time and corrects our understanding of marriage. So that's how we're going to look at it today. Any questions? We good? We good? You guys good? Do you have your own copy of the paper, the handouts? Good deal. Okay. The intimate community of life and love which constitutes the married state has been established by the creator and endowed by him with its own proper laws. God himself is the author of marriage. Okay, full stop, end of sentence. That's the number one point we have to get across. God himself is the author of marriage. If you look at biblical revelation, marriage existed before the fall. It predates, we're going to cover this later, uh, I think maybe tomorrow. It predates governments. It predates the state. The family is older than all of them. Okay, and this is an important point because the church wants to defend the natural meaning of marriage and the sacramental dignity of marriage and wants to defend both. So two atheists come together with the justice of the peace. They're considered married in the eyes of the church. Okay, because they're, they're not bound by the sacraments. Is it a natural marriage? It is between the couple. The sacrament of matrimony is the only sacrament that an individual does. The people who receive it are the ones who also give it. Right. So it's not the priest 
who does the marriage. The priest witnesses the vows, but it's the couple that exchanges them, right? When baptism, you have a minister that does it. In marriage, the exchanging of the vows makes the covenant between the two, right? So this is the sacrament that you give yourself, essentially. So the vocation, vocation, comes from the Latin vocare, to call. The vocation to marriage is written in the very nature of man and woman as they came from the hand of their creator. What the heck does that mean? Uh, if you look in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, where you have the unique creation of man, male, and female, you have the story of Adam and Eve. Adam is created first, right? And then God says, it is not good for man to be alone. I will create a partner suitable for him. And then what happens? He creates animals, right? Now, I always thought that was ridiculous. God didn't know what Adam was into, or maybe he did. Whoopsie. Uh, but the whole idea at its core Right. My my uh, biblical professor used to say, like, you know, he brings the animals forward. He names the animals showing dominion over. Them. But he still longs for a communion with a person. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, a lot of the catechism of the Catholic Church, especially when it talks about sexual theology, marriage, um, morality, is rooted in the teachings of Pope John Paul II. You familiar with Pope John Paul II? He was a Polish born. Uh, the first non-Italian in 500 years to be Pope. Um, he was uh, born in Poland in uh, right before or during World War I. He would come of age in World War II. Hello, hello, come on in. Good to see y'all. Good to see y'all. Just getting warmed up. <clears throat> he would come of age in World War II uh, as a young man when the Nazis had occupied Poland. He was an actor and an athlete, and he was aspiring to be a priest. So beforehand, uh, because the Nazis had occupied Poland by the time he was able to join the war effort, he began staging covert um, actions of political resistance. Welcome, welcome, y'all. You can sit anywhere. Maybe sit at that table. You can sit at that table. You're good to go. Um, he began staging these actions of cultural revolution against the Nazis. So what they do is they pack like 200 people into an apartment, and they would rehearse these national plays of Polish, you know, famous Polish plays. And because they couldn't do a whole stage, they would just reduce it to its most essential um, uh, parts. And it would be these long monologues or dialogues of one or two actors. And that really began to shape and mold them. If they were caught, they'd be executed by the Nazis. Well, the Nazis are eventually overthrown by, um, by the communists and then begins the communist regime. Pope John Paul, then Karol Wojtyla, enters into a clandestine, seminary while he's put into a forced labor factory situation and so the men that would gather around him they're like we will do all your labors if you need to go and study so he would get these textbooks and he would go hide in some corner and he would do all of his studying and then he would come out and he would work the rest of the day and this is how jp2 was trained to be a, a priest he would have to go secretly and go to the bishop and receive instruction and all this stuff and then he'd go his forced labor and all that. It was, it was pretty passionate. But it changed fundamentally the way he viewed his Christian faith amongst a totalitarian regime. Two totalitarian regimes. Pope John Paul in Poland developed a philosophy called personalism, which upholds and fights for the dignity of every human person. That's his focus, his goal. That's his expression. And so what Pope John Paul does is he develops this whole philosophy of the human person that fleshes itself out in two ways. He had a, um, a series of lectures at the only Catholic university after the Iron Curtain fell, or went up, um, Lublin University. And he taught there two classes, one called Love and Responsibility on uh, a philosophy of love and virtue and marriage and, all the, and, and sex, sexology and all this stuff. And then another one called Person and Act. Person and Act, which is just on the dignity of the human person, freedom, choice, all of this stuff. So the reason why I say all this is as you read these paragraphs in the Catechism, you will encounter the thought of Pope John Paul as expressed because it's particularly palpable for modern ears. What is a person as opposed to an object? An object is not a subject, only a person is. A person has an interior life that objects don't have. So because we have our own interior life, we are subjects, not just objects, right? How do we relate to subjects or persons is you relate to them not as objects to be used, but as persons to be loved. To treat a person like an object of use 
Pope John Paul would say, that's when you know there's sin involved, right? When you treat a person like an object of you. So I had a professor that studied under one of Pope John Paul's best friends growing up. She studied under him and she said that this professor would walk up to every student on the first day of school and he would look at them and he'd put his hand on their desk, you know, uncomfortably close to the professor and he would say, um, look at me, he would say, and what's your name? And she'd be like, uh, Patricia. And he'd go, Patricia, Patricia. And then lean in. This would be so creepy if this happened, but I'm going to do this to you all the next week. Uh, he would say, Patricia, it is good. And he'd stare right into her eyes. It is good that you are. And it is good that you are you. And then, yes. And then he'd go on to the next one. And he did it. The whole class was taken up by him going to every student in the class, seeing their face, staring into their eyes, and telling them it's good that they exist. And it's good that they are you, that unique kind of existence. And everyone is like a little weirded out. For the rest of the year, I mean, for the rest of the class, he knew all their names and faces. He would see her around campus like two or three years later, and he was like, Patricia, how are we today? You know, he just memorized it because he really tried to live out this personalistic norm. You are a good, you're not just an end in and of, in and of yourself to advance, or excuse me, you are an end in and of yourself. You're not a means to an end for me to advance my career. So I remember in class, uh, Dr. Donahue said, okay, uh, who is someone that you can instrumentalize, reduce to a tool? And I was like, oh, I know a lot of tools, but uh, <laughs> who can I reduce it? And, and I thought of that and I was like, you know, I used to be a checkout guy at a grocery store called Randall's in the Woodlands. And she was like, tell me about that. And I was like, people treat you like a cog in a machine all the time. Like there's just scan the dang things. I got to go, you know? And I would do that all the time. Sometimes I would embarrass the customers. I'd get on the microphone and do price checks when people were obviously uncomfortable about items. You had to get your way back sometimes, you know. But the, that notion of we can so easily turn into instruments, people who are persons, the deserving of their own interior life. So the kind of the culmination of the human person is not just freedom, but freedom subordinated to love. Freedom subordinated to love. So I love my wife. She's, she's wonderful. But before we got married, <laughs> yeah, that's a weird segue. I love my wife, but <laughs> no. Before we got married, my wife and I were dating for years. We met in college, all this stuff. We were dating for years. And I had this problem of commitment. I, didn't have, I wasn't making eyes at other women. It was her. I loved her. I knew I loved her. But I had done that subtle American thing where we get afraid of making commitment because we know it limits our freedom. So the question is, do we subordinate love to freedom or freedom to love, right? Do we say, and th this is the problem, right? We think, well, I don't wanna be, you know, the old ball and chain. I don't wanna be yoked with one person my whole life or whatever it might be. And so the idea for me was, I, I like I knew I loved Shannon, but I, I could not make that commitment. And it wasn't until she made me, gave me an ultimatum, look, buddy, we need to progress towards marriage or else. And I was, and I chose or else. I totally chose or else. And, and she broke up with me. I'll never forget her leaving that apartment. I was like, oh, wow, I guess you know, six years of my life is done. And she left. And she was so furious with me. And then like a month later, I was like, hey, girl, <laughs> that was the biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> And I asked her, I begged her to come back. And she was like, and I'll never forget that she said, and now it's me saying no to you. And she got up and left. And I was like, well, that, that's not how this is supposed to work. That's not how it's supposed to work at all. Come back, right? You were supposed to be waiting for me, right? Till I figured my, even though I had broken up with her like five or six times before, that's neither here nor there. So I commenced on a mission to woo and win her back. Didn't work. I proposed to her. I proposed on my knees, ring. I had all this various Catholic paraphernalia to woo and win her. And she just, no, gave it all back to me. And I was like, well, that's that's awful. Then I went through the worst summer of my life. I tell people uh, I, I was going through hell. Now looking back when hell is purgatory. But I was going through hell and people would be like, listen, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. This is how dramatic I am. I would be like, yeah, there is. It's an oncoming train. Right, like everything, people would try to console me, and I would just. I had one spiritual director who said, "Listen, I just want you to take a book of the Bible, and just spend time just going through that, and make it your prayer." So I chose Job, right, the most miserable, suffering wretch. And then another guy came up, another priest, and he's like, "You need to knock off the whole Job thing." 
pick a different book. So I chose Lamentations, right? That's how dramatic I am. Welcome to the party. Um, I can to yeah, she knows. She knows. Um, yeah, she was a junior high schooler when I was going through all this. Um, but the whole idea of this was um, I was subordinating love to the concept of freedom and my own freedom. And the human person is that type of good that must be free in its act of saying, yes, consent, freedom, must be essential to love. Because love cannot be forced. If love is forced, it's not love. If love is forced, it's not love. Right? Love must come freely. But there, the, the idea, if love is the highest good, then he focuses on a very specific philosophical concept called communio personarum in Latin, the communion of persons, the communion of persons. The ultimate expression of the communion of persons is not a married couple. It's not parents and children. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In the very mystery of the Trinity itself, it is one God in three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father gives himself entirely to the Son. That's the nature of love. When we ask ourselves, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. When we ask that question, what is love? God manifests. He reveals it in and of himself. God is love. 1 John 4, 8. 1 John 4, 16. God is love. Well, what then is this love? It is self-donation, self-gift. The Father gives him to the Son. The Son doesn't take that gift. The Son receives the gift of this divine love. And that reciprocity of giving and receiving, giving and receiving, the gift of self, repeatedly offered and received, becomes... The bond, or not become, but the bond between the Father and the Son is so real, so intense, and so infinite. It's the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. So what is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the bond of love that unites the Father to the Son. The very same Holy Spirit, by the way, that when Christ died and rose from the dead on Pentecost, breathed out upon the apostles. The very thing that unites from all eternity before creation, that perfectly unites God the Father to his Son, God the Son, through his death and resurrection, poured out upon you by virtue of your baptism, by virtue of your yes to Christ. So the reason why we talk about sacrament of matrimony as a sacrament is because two people with that life of the Holy Spirit within them, two people who actually live by faith, right, who had themselves transformed by this, that is a glowing sacrament. I mean, what was the first miracle that Jesus ever worked? It was at a wedding. It was at the wedding feast of Cana. The first miracle that Jesus ever worked was at a wedding feast. St. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, called himself the friend of the bride. We, we would call him the best man at the wedding. And he's the one that goes forth and announces the coming of the bridegroom, right? This marital imagery is fused throughout, permeates all of the Gospels. But we don't have eyes to see it anymore because we don't understand the biblical understanding of marriage. So all of that... In, in, as we go through, you're going to hear the phrase person. You're going to hear the phrase <clears throat> uh, communion, community a lot. Keep that in mind that God in and of himself is a communio personarum, a communion of persons. And we are made in the image of that God. That's why it's not good for man to be alone. In Genesis chapter one, you know, like seven to ten times it says it is good. Right? God creates, it is good. God does a new thing, it is good. It is good, it is good. Behold, it is very good. Then you go into chapter 2, and the next time it uses the word good, it's modified by the word not. It is not good. What's not good? For man to be alone. Why? Because you're made in the image of a God who is not alone. You are made in the image of a God who is forever united, the lover, the beloved, and the love that unites them. Think about that. Everyone in this room wants two things more than anything else. And it breaks our heart when we don't get it. Everyone in this room wants to be known and loved. Everyone, without exception. We want to be known and we want to be loved. To be loved but not known, what is that? That's superficial. That's weak. You can't build a relationship off that. You can't build a life off that. To be loved but not known, you can't love someone you don't know. So the other day, perfect example, I was at a Taylor Swift concert, 40,000 of my closest middle school friends. And I'm hanging out, enjoying, and a baby just say yes and all the good stuff. And I'm walking out of the of the thing at the end of the concert, had a great time laughing and joking with my friends, heading out the back door, and all of a sudden Taylor Swift gets back on the microphone. And she says, to all my fans, and we're all like, oh, and we turn and we look, and she says, I love you. 
Listen, I know what I look like. I'm a chubby little homeschooler, right? I have never been involved in my entire life in a love triangle. So I call my wife and I'm like, honey, Tay Tay, she's in love with me. Like, I don't know what we do now. Do I got to call a lawyer? Like, I'm scared, but I'm also excited. What do I do? Right now, that's absurd because we know that Taylor Swift does not know me. She does not love me. Right. We know this. Why do we know this? Because when Taylor Swift sees me, she just sees dollar signs and like a yacht in the Mediterranean. She does not see a life lived in exclusive love. So we understand that. It's superficial and weak to say, oh, I love all my fans. Okay. But what about the opposite? You ever thought of that? What if we are known but not loved? What is that? We are known but not loved. If being loved but not known is superficial and weak, what is to be known but not loved? Being known but not loved, I would say, is our greatest nightmare. Right, for someone to come up to us and say, I know you, I know the real you. No one could ever love you, right? No one could ever, who could ever in their right minds? No, 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 not this fake image of you, the real you. And I would say, I've did years of youth ministry. I have known people, right, who have lived as posers and fakes and all of this stuff in their desperate desire to have someone like them. They will act like everyone else in order to get someone to acknowledge them. I know you, I know the real you. Who could ever love you? So they hide. We all do this shocking thing. Found out there's a thing called Finsta. If you have high schoolers, you should ask them about Finsta. What's Finsta? It's the fake Instagram. So I asked this girl, I said, what, what the heck is a Finsta? And they said, well, it's your fake Instagram. Now for some people, a fake Instagram is how they make incredibly horrible comments on the internet without it being tied to their real account. Okay, that's some people's Finstas. Uh, for other people, though, and for this girl in particular, her Finsta was a private account that only her friends were on. And she had about 15, 16 specific people that were allowed to see it, as opposed to her real Instagram, which had a thousand people on it, everyone from, you know, the Woodlands High School. And when she was on her real Instagram, she never had a picture of herself without makeup on, you know, with her clothing looking good, you know, all the things, the fun stuff, the, I guess people take pictures of their food still. Um, all that, but the fin stuff was her like first thing in the morning, hey y'all, what up squad, or whatever teenagers say, and doing that. And it was her, but this is the crazy thing. This is how messed up we are. For her, her finsta, her fake Instagram was actually her real self, but the one that she hides from the masses. For the masses, her real Instagram was actually her and her most fake. Why? Because she would rather, she has a group of people, thank God, who know her and love her as she is. But the image that she projects, I mean, we do this all, there's a reason why Facebook is called fake book. Oh, this is my picture, yeah, from 20 pounds ago, right? Like like my picture in that book, right? Right, that's a picture from literally 10 years ago, I was just sharing with them. So we do this because we are scared of being alone. So we compromise. Now this is the uniqueness of the Christian gospel. God knows you. God knows everything that you have ever done wrong God knows every desire of your heart, every good thing, every hope, dream, every, you know, whatever. He knows what you did last summer, right? God knows, and he knows what you did last summer too. Well, that was a better movie, just kidding. God knows you down to your core, and he loves you, and God loves you. He loves you so much. It's not that he's glossing over what we did wrong, but we as Catholic Christians believe that in the fullness of time, God was born of a woman, entered into this world, took the cross, not because he had to, not because like there was some divine inevitability. He did it because, and he says it, I laid down my life freely and I will take it up again. No greater love is there than this, he who lays down his life for his beloved. See, when Christ entered this world, right, he entered this world to free us from the very things that would make us hostile to God, that do make us hostile to God. You know, St. Paul says this great line, it reminds me whenever I do prison ministry, I go up to a maximum security prison about an hour north of here. Men's unit, gang violence, uh, all that stuff. And there's a line where St. Paul in, in Romans says, maybe for a good person, one can be persuaded to die. Right? He's given this hypothetical. Would you die for your spouse? Most days. Yeah, I would do that <laughs> most of the time. Right for my kids, maybe that average is a little skewed, but yeah, sure, I would die for them. So, you, like, you would lay down. You might be persuaded for a good person to die, but what about for a person that up there at the uh, at one of these prison units that you don't know? Would you die for them? 
Did they do the crime? Yeah. They'll admit it. Serving consecutive life sentences. Would you die for them? Wow. I mean, I don't know. No. Right. Like, what do we do? Oh, mm. Well, this is what St. Paul is. His whole point is, and yet we, while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Right. So that notion that I, I know what you've done. I know all you all the way down to the soles of your feet. And yet my love for you is not diminished. But rather, my love for you is so great because it's infinite. My love for you can actually absorb your unloveliness into myself. And I can actually remove it from you. So the heart of this Christian mystery is this bridal imagery that Christ wants for every single believer to be known and to be loved. Well, guess what? You are right now. Imperfectly by your spouse, perfectly by the one your spouse represents. That is God. He loves you. Marriage is not a purely human institution. Despite the many variations it has undergone through the centuries in different cultures, social structures, and spiritual attitudes, these differences should not cause us to forget its common and permanent characteristics. Although the dignity of this institution is not transparent everywhere with the same clarity, some sense of the greatness of the matrimonial union exists in all cultures. Now, I just want to make a tangent remark on that. The New York Times did a fascinating study on millennials and marriage. And they found that millennials are delaying and delaying marriage so much. Um, they thought the idea was you, many of you come from, you know, broken past, whatever. They despise marriage. And they actually interviewed thousands of millennials in the New York metro area. And it was fascinating to hear their responses. Their responses weren't. I'm afraid to get married because I don't think marriage is worth anything. They had an angelic view of marriage that they felt like they couldn't attain. So even in their despairing of getting married, they elevated the idea of marriage. I have to be perfect and I have to marry the perfect person. And if you all know, if you want a perfect marriage, you probably shouldn't be a part of it because you're going to skew that average. Look, I found the perfect person. She's moving on. Okay, so... The well-being of the individual person and of both human and Christian society is closely bound up with the healthy state of conjugal and family life. I love that phrase. The healthy state of conjugal life. Amen. God, 1604, God who created man out of love also calls him to love the fundamental and innate vocation of every human being. What is your vocation? I don't know what you're called to with what job you're going to have, but fundamentally you are called to love as your Savior loves you. For man is created in the image and likeness of God who is himself Love. Since God created him, man and woman, their mutual love becomes an image of the absolute and unfailing love with which God loves man. An image. If you want, take out a pen and circle that sucker. Their mutual love becomes an image. That's what marriage is meant to represent. That's why we sacramentalize our marriages. It is good, very good in the creator's eyes. This love which God blesses is intended to be fruitful and to be realized in the common work of watching over creation. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. What was the first commandment? The first commandment in the Bible is not, Have no other gods besides me. The first commandment comes in Genesis, uh, after Genesis 20, 1.26, where God creates us. He then says, Be fruitful and multiply. So the command to have this conjugal family life is the first command of the Bible. Yet many Christians have this view that the church or the Bible teaches sex is dirty and disgusting. So save it for someone you love, right? Like these weirdo contrary messages. That's not true. That's not the heart of the Christian message. 1605, Holy Scripture affirms that man and woman were created for one another. It is not good that the man should be alone. The woman, flesh of his flesh. So when Adam, right, God causes a deep sleep to fall upon the man, from his side, he fashions his bride, not from the hair of his head, to be a lord over him, nor from the skin of the soles of his feet to be a slave under him, but from his side to be his helpmate and bride. When Adam wakes up, he sees the woman and he says, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And then in Hebrew, he says, she shall be called Isha, for she came from her Ish. She shall be called woman, for she came from her man. The idea that when Adam saw Eve in her naked glory, he gazed upon her body in its physicalness, and he saw something there that was pretty important. Aha, aha, 
I or you are literally physically made for me. And I am physically, literally made for you. Pope John Paul calls this the language of the gift. That the language of the body, not just body language like how are you standing, but the actual body itself points to something greater. It points to that man can only find himself through a sincere gift of himself. How do I know who I am and whose I am? You give yourself away. You give yourself away. That's the heart of what the creation story is getting at. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife. I love that phrase, cleaves, because it would take a cleaver to separate the two, right? And they become one flesh. The Lord himself shows that this signifies an unbreakable union of their two lives by recalling what the plan of the creator had been in the beginning. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Now, here's the important part. Oftentimes, priests and fancy theologian types and people who have theological educations, we kind of stop there. And so when we talk about marriage, you can obviously tell these are people who have never been married because when they actually talk about marriage, it sounds very idealistic and not realistic, right? And so I, now that I've been married for 10 years, I look around, I'm like, man, I was a naive person when I would come out and be like, I want to tell you all the stuff I learned. Now, it doesn't make it not true, but it does make it that this next set of paragraphs, this next subchapter or whatever, is incredibly important to understand going forward. This next part is the most important part, and then we'll go for a little break here after we go through it. Marriage under the regime of sin, 1606. No one wants to talk about sin today. We don't want to talk about sin. I don't want to talk about sin. No one wants to talk about sin. What is sin? Sin is not a mistake. A mistake happens because of a lack of knowledge. Let me give you, to me, the perfect example. I am terrible at geometry. When I was in high school, I was... I guessed on a placement exam to get into private school, all the answers on the math test, and I got placed in advanced math, which in our, in our time was geometry for freshmen. I never had, I had pre-algebra and algebra, now I'm in geometry, I was scared. You guys remember proofs? Proofs are terrible. So I go into this geometry class, which was taught by a monotone tennis coach who didn't want to be there, neither did I. And so he would say, because you know, once you get into high school, kids stop raising their hand, right? You know, and, volunteering answers. He said, if you volunteer your homework assignment to do it in front of the class for the beginning of class, I'll give you 10 points extra credit. And I knew I was going to desperately need those 10 points extra credit. So every morning he's like, do I have a volunteer? And I would raise my hand and I would go up there and there was a triangle and I had to figure out an angle and I don't know how to do this. And I had to write the proof over here and get the angle answer. So I would write the whole thing down there and he would go, Every time you go, you always tap his nose with his finger and go, Mr. Gormley, how did you get number two? And I would go, oh, great question. I guessed. <laughs> he would just be like, Mr. Gormley. And I'm like, I don't get it. I don't get it. Give me my 10 points. And so we would walk through and I'd be like, oh, that makes it every day, five days a week for a whole semester. I would do this. Now, I ended that with a B plus, solely based on massive amounts of extra credit points. When he would grade my test, he would hand it back. Everything other than proofs, I would get a pretty good grade on. But when it came to the proofs, which are always the end of the page, he would just hold the paper out, and it's just a sea of red, a sea of red. And he would go, Mr. Gormley, I will give you half credit. And I was like, I don't care. <laughs> I'm not, not going to get it today or tomorrow. Now, here's the deal. I made mistakes because of a lack of knowledge. Right? A mistake happens because you don't have the knowledge. How do you fix a mistake? Well, I sit there, I get my half point extra credit because, oh, I see what I did wrong and I correct it. You correct a mistake. What's a sin? A sin is I did something wrong with the presence of knowledge. See, that's the fundamental difference. Like, let's, let's take it out of here and let's put it on a politician, right? You get a politician having a press conference. I need to apologize to my family and my constituents. I have done something wrong. I've made a mistake. And you're sitting there and you're listening to this guy apologizing. And you're like, how do you buy plane tickets for three years to make a mistake? How do you plan a mistake? How do you, what do you mean by it's just, I don't know what it is, but it seems like it's a little bit more than a mistake. See, that's the difference is a mistake is because of a lack of knowledge. You get the knowledge, you correct the mistake. But a sin, when it's present with the knowledge, you can't just correct because you did it. Anyway, knowing 
that it was wrong. The Catholic Church holds you are not guilty for any sin that you did not know was wrong. We call it sufficient knowledge. If you didn't know it was wrong, it might still objectively be a wrong thing. But subjectively, you didn't choose to cooperate with that evil. So the church is sitting here saying, well, how do we look at this as people in marriage? We might unintentionally offend our bride or our, 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 our groom, right? We might unintentionally offend each other. So the idea is, how can we forgive that? Well, we forgive it through correcting with knowledge. Hey, that hurt me, right? Self-knowledge. Every time I keep doing this thing, I need you to call me out on that. That's how we correct mistakes. But what if you knew it and you did it anyway, right? It's like my kids, right? Whenever I catch them doing something wrong, what do they say? One word, mm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're like, when they say, I'm sorry, like it just, and they roll their eyes kind of, daddy goes back crazy. Okay, so I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry. So you're not sorry that you did it. You're just sorry you got caught. You're just sorry you got caught. I'm sorry, right? Now, what if your kid did something stupid and you're like, ah, I told you not to do that. And they looked at you and they said, you're right. I'm sorry. I knew it was wrong and I did it anyway. And I'm sorry. You'd be like, what just happened? Who are you? Right? That idea of I knew it was wrong, but I did it anyway. So how do we address this sin? Well, this is what we want to talk about marriage, not just marriage where there might be sin. But what the Catechism calls it is the regime of shin. sin, not shin. That's a different thing. Totally different thing. Uh, 1606. Every man, now remember man, this is written in 1992, man, male, and female. Every man experiences evil around him and within himself. Sultan Eason, the line between good and evil is drawn not just between nations or neighborhoods, but right down the center of every human heart. This experience makes itself felt in the relationships between man and woman. No one can hurt you more than the person you are closest to. We've all experienced that. We all know that. One time me and my wife were having a big fight, an argument over money, because I'm really insecure when it comes to money because I work for the church. And I'm always scared we'll never have enough because we never have enough. So I'm freaking out over something. And me and my wife, and I bring up all the old laundry that I'm dumping in front of her. I told you guys I was dramatic, right? And my wife, I said to her, and this is, this is an example I have her permission to use. I said, with the amount of debt you brought into our marriage, it's amazing you're not a doctor. And I was saying it as a joke. For some weird reason, she was deeply offended and ran off furious at me, right? No one can hurt you quite like the people who know you the best, right? And so that's the point of that first line or second line. This experience makes itself felt in the relationships between man and woman, right? Your friends can hurt you but your girl can hurt you in a totally different way, right? It can cut you so deep and vice versa. Their union has always been threatened by discord, a spirit of domination, infidelity, jealousy, and conflicts that can escalate into hatred and separation. This disorder, meaning a disorder of love, can manifest itself more or less acutely and can be more or less overcome according to the circumstances of culture, eras, and individuals but it does seem to have a universal character. There's a little philosophical statement there. According to faith, the disorder we notice so painfully does not stem from the nature of man and woman, nor from the nature of their relations, as if your relationship was somehow inherently evil, right? But from sin. As a break with God, the first sin had for its first consequence the rupture of the original communion between man and woman. What happens when Eve eats the fruit? It's scripture says that she turned and gave some to her husband, quote, who was with her, and he ate of it. And the eyes of both of them were open. They knew that they were naked. And then they made aprons or fig They took fig leaves and made aprons. I think that's a funny phrase. I'm sure it's something different in the original Hebrew. But they made aprons that said kiss the cook for themselves to hide their nudity from one another. Now, why is that so important? Philosophically, there is so much there. The first thing they did when sin entered the picture, you had original innocence, original justice, they loved one another completely without sin. He did not treat her like an object. She did not treat him like an object. Sin entered the picture, and the first thing they do is the bride covers her nudity from her husband's eyes, and he does the same from hers. They put up a barrier between the two to protect themselves from the look of the other. 
right? And then you have God. Scripture says that God entered the garden. He walked into the garden and called out, where are you? Now, I think oftentimes we fancy modern people have this image of God being like, where is everyone? Hey, guys! Right? That the phrase walks the garden is transgress. He, uh, in the Psalms, it says that his footsteps shatter the cedars of Lebanon. This is God coming in judgment. Now read that phrase, where are you? Totally different context. Where are you? In relation to me, where are you? And what does Adam say? I heard your voice while I was in the garden, and I hid myself because I was naked. Right? So now you don't just see alienation from his bride. You see alienation of the man from God. So then God says, you've eaten the fruit that I told you not to eat. And Adam does something incredible. He says, it was the woman that thou put here with me. So immediately God's like, oh, you've eaten the fruit. He's like, well, it was the woman. It was her fault. But then he puts the blame ultimately even on God. It was the woman that you gave me. She ate the fruit, bid me to take it. So I did. And then he turns to the woman. Did you do this? She said, well, it was the serpent. He tricked me. If there was a squirrel running by, they would have blamed the squirrel, right? This whole movement of blame and passing the buck of rationalization is what happens to sin. When sin enters our heart, what do we do? Our brilliant intellect, our reason gets reduced to rationalization. Well, I did it because, well, you see, work, they owed me. You know, we come up with these rationalizations. And what Christ is asking of us is to dispense with the nonsense and to own up. To say, I did it. I know I did it. I know it was wrong, but I chose it anyway, and I'm sorry. That's what we call repentance. <clears throat> Their relations were distorted by mutual recriminations. It was the woman you put here with me. Their mutual attraction, the creator's own gift, changed into a relationship of domination and lust. And the beautiful vocation of man and woman to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth was burdened by the pain of childbirth and the toil of work. There at its heart, the consequences, the law of unintended consequences spilled forth. Nevertheless, and this is hope, 1608, nevertheless, nevertheless, the order of creation persists, though seriously disturbed. So it didn't absolutely destroy all that came before, all that God loaded into it, all the meaning and value to heal the wounds of sin. Man and woman needed the help of the grace that God in his infinite mercy never refuses them, never refuses them. That is the language of hope. That is the language of hope because when marriage gets bad, when things get difficult, when your own life is spinning out of control, scripture is very clear, the catechism is very clear, God never refuses you the grace to overcome it. Now we might think, well, God, you could have done it in a different way, a better way. I would take plan B rather than the plan that you're giving me. However, God promises you. He's not a father who abandons you. He will come through. Without his help, man and woman cannot achieve the union of their lives for which God created them in the beginning. Okay, with that, we're going to take a little break, right? We're going to take a little, little break. Uh, we'll do 7.30, so it's 7.24, and uh, we'll come back. Is that okay, Mary? No. No, Mary says no. All right, uh, so, uh, let's go on. Uh, two bathrooms right outside the hallway. Two bathrooms right there. Water fountain, Coke machine. If you have any questions, let me know. It's recording. Is it a great angle for you? Uh, I mean, if people like a large, hairy, ugly man, then yes. <laughs> Slightly up. It's so funny. The magic of technology. Oh. Michael, yeah. We have 327 Wow. Guess how many rounds we find? Uh, five. Eleven. Oh. Only because they just registered for the action. Mmm. Mmm. Bless their hearts. We'll be back there. Bless their hearts. They'll get it all done nice and quick. Yeah. But we're in good shape. Safe environment. That is a Lenten prayer book devotional thing. I got a whole bunch of copies from these fine folks down in 
the Diocese of Wollongong, Australia. And so uh, they sent me a bunch. Wollongong. There's only O's as vowels. Wollongong. I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. but uh, So they sent me a bunch, so I've been giving them away before Lent falls upon our hearts. They also sent me a CD of all original music that they composed. It is baller. It is amazing. No, really? Wollongong. Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. No, they don't mess around. So what they do is they take uh, famous artwork and they explain the artwork and how it connects to the particular feast day, and then they go through the different, the different things. And I'm a contributor there. And I wrote three articles the day it was due. I totally forgot. And he's like, "Hey, man, can I get your articles?" And I was like, Rawr! "Yes, you can," because <laughs> I don't know your how to do deadlines. Huh? Is your picture in there? Yeah, my picture from. 20 pounds ago and 10 years ago. Really? Is it the yeah. one where with no glasses? Yeah. And the... That's it. <laughs> yes, that is everything. He said it's my LinkedIn photo. <laughs> that is <Yeah>. so... <laughs> I look like, uh... like a sad, like sad a child, man. Child, uh, child teen star. In that picture, I look like yes. a particular child. Michael J. Fox. Family ties. Not Chris <laughs> yeah, that picture. Uh, she's laughing. <laughs> I don't believe it. I don't believe it. It's funny because the guy's like, uh, "I'm gonna take your picture real quick. Uh, take off your glasses." And I was like, "Okay, let's do this." <laughs> right? Like, no, thank you. Like, I wear glasses every day of my life. Funny story. So I got these glasses. I desperately needed them for years, but I actually got them the day my then girlfriend rejected my proposal. I you know so these uh, these are like four years old, but the ones I had before I were seven years old. I have for seven. Years. I'll never forget. And I just came out, change? huh? And the eyes didn't change. Nope. Eyesight. Nope. Probably will now because I've become a fanatic for YouTube, so I don't <laughs> stare at a screen a lot. But no, I uh, our parish had taken a tour of a church and did a day a morning. And we got a bus back, and Father Tom said, you guys can have the afternoon off. And we're like, yay! And I got in my car, and I drove straight to Lens Crafters or whatever the store was called. I got my new glasses, feeling pretty good. I'm waiting for Shannon to get back to me. Three days, right? Three days darkness. She comes back, and about two hours later, she pulls this big purse out and gives me all the gifts plus the ring that I gave her. And I was like, that sucks. No, these I got a Warby, Warby Parker, you know, because I'm so fancy. I, I'm, as a millennial, I have to get all my stuff online now. So these are a Warby Parker. These are three or four years old. So. Our kids through, nice. 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 Oh, yeah. My daughter, my oldest daughter, just got glasses. Or they end up in the lake. Yeah, that makes sense. That definitely makes sense. <sighs> All right, y'all. We got three pages to fly through, and by fly, I mean diligently <laughs> listen to my tangents. Um, any questions yet so far? I know I talk a lot. I told you I was going to talk a lot. A lot of talking. Okay? Marriage in the Lord, 1612. Marriage in the Lord, 1612. Page three of six. So right above it is marriage under the pedagogy of the law. A pedagogue in Greek was a slave who was assigned to an aristocratic child who would accompany them to school and beat them when they weren't paying attention to teacher. Uh, eventually, the phrase pedagogue or pedagogy would describe uh, uh, the art of teaching, right? What we call, you know, lesson planning, things like that. So it's under the pedagogy of the law. What that is implying is from the time of the patriarchs, which take over after the fall, right? The time of patriarchs up to Moses, you have a slow refining and pulling back or restraining 
the regime of sin. So for instance, in 1610, it talks about, in the Old Testament, the polygamy of the patriarchs and kings is not yet explicitly rejected, right? So you have this understanding of the pedagogy, the moving towards what would eventually be the fullness of the teaching of Christ and the Gospels. Um, and you have this phrase, even though according to the Lord's words, it still carries traces of man's hardness of heart, which was the reason Moses permitted uh, divorce of men and their wives. So there's a famous debate between um, Jesus and a bunch of scholars of the law. And people who don't realize this in Matthew 19, it says they were in the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Now that should trigger something in our head because that's where John the Baptist was preaching and baptizing, the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, meaning on the other side of the Jordan. And that's where John the Baptist was preaching. That's where Herod, um, the one Herod forced his brother to divorce his wife so that he could marry her. And that happened because he was uh, much more powerful than his brother. And John the Baptist railed against that Herod, not the famous Herod of the infancy narratives, but the Herod, uh, the, the son or grandson. And he railed against them and eventually would have his head chopped off. You know that phrase, uh, serve it to him on a silver platter, right? That is what happened when uh, the woman Herodias had her daughter dance for Herod and in his drunkenness, he says, I'll give you half my kingdom, whatever you want. She said, I want the head of John the Baptist. So he served it to her on silver platter, right? So the Pharisees are with Jesus in the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, where John the Baptist ministry happened and where it promptly came to a head chopped off end, right? So what was it about? It was about Herod forcing his brother to divorce his wife. Is that a valid cause for divorce? Absolutely not. But this is why the Pharisees were doing this. They were trying to trap Jesus to politically destroy him. So they say to Jesus, can a man divorce his wife for any cause? For any cause. That's the phrase in Matthew chapter 19. And Jesus redirects everything and doesn't just not respond to the trap, but he slams the trap shut in their own face by showing them they don't even understand the very law that they had to memorize. In order to be a Pharisee, you had to not only memorize, but stand up and recite Genesis to Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, recite it all the way through. So you had to master this. It's like going up to an ACLU, uh, ACLU lawyer and saying, haven't you ever heard of free speech? Right? The, Jesus, haven't you ever heard of how the creator made the male and female from the beginning? They'd be like, what? Of course I know that. Don't you tell me. Like, I, Jesus was totally using holy sarcasm. And he threw it back in the face. But this is where he introduces the concept. They said, well, Moses permitted it. And Jesus says he permitted it because of your hardness of heart. But from the beginning, it was not so. So Pope John Paul II, in his famous Theology of the Body, these were a series of lectures that he gave over five years on marriage in the divine plan. The theology of the body is sweeping, it is huge, it addresses scientific, philosophical, all sorts of different concerns, but from the heart of the gospel. And it starts with this, Matthew 19, 19, 19, Matthew 19 and Jesus's words from the beginning or in the beginning. Why? He says that three times in a handful of verses. And what the Pope does is he says, okay, let's look at what the creator's intention was from the beginning, not after sin is introduced, but before sin is introduced. Because we know one of the effects of sin is a hardness, a hardening of our hearts. So what happens before that? And so that's where we get this understanding. Okay, so under the law, Moses was steering us, but it wasn't perfect. Now Jesus is coming to restore. The nuptial covenant, 1612, the nuptial covenant between God and his people Israel had prepared the way for the new and everlasting covenant in which the Son of God, by becoming incarnate, right, the word incarnation, ation, the action of, in, in, carne, what is chili con carne? Chili with meat, right? Yeah, you put meat in the chili. This is my standard uh, introduction of this. Incarnation, the enfleshment of the Son of God, right? This is Christmas. By becoming incarnate, and giving his life, it's not enough that he became one of us and came to us. He then gave his life, because that's what love does, it's self-gift, has united to himself in a certain way all mankind saved by him, thus preparing for the wedding feast of the Lamb. The bridegroom enters the bridal chamber. Instead of a beautiful wedding, it's a murder scene, a scene of political oppression. It's the cross on Calvary, right? It's the cross on Calvary. On the threshold of his public life, Jesus performs 
his first sign. At his mother's request, you got to love that, obedient to mommy, at his mother's request during a wedding feast. The public ministry of Jesus is begun at a wedding feast, the wedding feast in Cana. The church attaches great importance to Jesus' presence at the wedding in Cana. She sees in it the confirmation of the goodness of marriage and the proclamation that thenceforth marriage will be an efficacious sign of Christ's presence. Now, I have a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old at home, and she's uh, preparing to receive her first Holy Communion and first reconciliation. And as we are preparing her, I say, honey, what is a sacrament? What is a sacrament? Right? And she says, it's an outward sign instituted by Christ that gives God's grace. It's an outward sign instituted by Christ that gives God's grace. Another great definition of a sacrament is an efficacious sign. What does efficacious mean? Efficare, efficare, it means to do or to make or to accomplish. So an efficacious sign is a sign that accomplishes the very thing it signifies. So I always give them the, and of course my daughters are so funny, efficacious, they don't know what the heck that word means. So I'm like, here's an efficacious, here's not an efficacious sign. If I'm driving down the street and there's a stop sign, does that stop sign make my car stop? And they're like, yes. I'm like, no, it tells me I should stop, but can I just drive straight through it? And they say, yes. In fact, daddy, you did that on your first driver's test because my kids remember every story I tell them. Blew right through a stop sign on my first drive, lost, didn't get my license. Anywho, it's a wound I carry. Uh, just because there's a stop sign doesn't mean I'm going to stop. What's an efficacious sign? An umpire calling out. It's, uh, I love that example. Bishop Robert Barron gives that example. When an umpire says, out, he's out, right? What happens? Well, the very pronunciation of it causes the reality of it, right? So he declares it. The sign is the word and the gesture, right? And he's out of there, right? And that's what happens. A sacrament is an efficacious sign. What does that mean? Outwardly, there are signs, whether it's the vows exchanged by the two, the confession of sins in the confessional, right? Uh, the pouring of water in baptism. Those are the outward signs that we human beings made with a body need, right? But they impart interior grace. They impart God's free gift of God's own life. And so marriage is an efficacious sign. What does it point to? The union of God with you as an individual and with the church as a whole. 1614, in preaching Jesus, he univocally taught the original meaning of the union of man and woman as the creator willed it from the beginning. There's that from the beginning. Permission given by Moses to divorce one's wife was a concession to the hardness of their hearts. What do we mean by that? The rabbis would say that Moses gave that so that the men would not kill their wives, right? That was the, in the desert, in the desert wanderings when the Deuteronomy command was given. The matrimonial union of man and woman is indissoluble. God, has, God himself has determined it. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. We've already said that like four times, that scripture quote. 1615, this univocal insistence, unequivocal, excuse me, unequivocal insistence on the indissolubility of, mar of the marriage bond may have left some perplexed and could be seen as a demand impossible to realize. What the heck does that mean? Well, right when Jesus says, you cannot put asunder what God has joined together. The apostles are right there, and they're listening to Jesus say this. And the Pharisees go away, and the apostles are so confused. And they say, you're telling me I can't? So there are two camps, Hillel and Shammai at the time. They debated over what are the causes to divorce a wife. Women couldn't divorce men. So one cause was if she burns your breakfast, you could have another one to make you dinner. Right. Ooh, OK, that's a that's a pretty wide, generous definition. The other one was no, only for marital infidelity. Right. Or something traumatic like that. And so here you have these disciples and their first response when Jesus says marriage is indissoluble. They say, well, Jesus, if that's true, every time I do that, Siri kicks on. Uh, they said, well, it'd be better not to get married. Right, do you see that? Jesus is saying, it's with one woman for the rest of your life. And they're like, whoa, maybe it'd be better to never get married. It reminds me of uh, Osama bin Laden's dad, who in, in the Muslim culture, you can always have, you can have up to four wives, right? Right? Yeah, you got up to, up to four wives. So he only ever at one time had four wives. He just got divorced like 30 or 40 times. And he always had that slot reserved, right? Osama bin Laden's dad. Um, but there's a notion, right, that Jesus says this. And they were just like, whoa, if that's true, it would be better not to be married. And that's why it says right here, um, 
uh, yeah, right here. The marriage bond may have left some perplexed and could seem to be a demand impossible to realize. Yeah, you know who thought that? The first apostles. However, Jesus has not placed on spouses a burden impossible to bear or too heavy, heavier than the law of Moses. By coming to restore the original order of creation disturbed by sin, he, give, he himself gives the strength and grace to live marriage in the new dimension of the reign of God. It is by following Christ, renouncing themselves and taking up their crosses that spouses will be able to receive, not take, the original meaning of marriage and to live it with the help of Christ. The grace of Christian marriage is a fruit of Christ's cross, the source of all Christian life. Anytime you have two people living together in close proximity, you will have strife. You will always, every time. I mean, not you guys, other your friends, your friends. You always do. Why? Because you're distinct human persons. God did not invent the Xerox machine. We did. You are distinct human persons. Your loves and joys and desires overlap some, and sometimes your pet peeves can drive you insane about the other. It can become huge. I never want to send our kids to public school. I never want to send them to private school. Blah, blah, blah. You people, we can have wars over all sorts of stuff. So how do we find union? We find union not in cleverness, but in the cross. We find union in the cross. Because let's be honest, if you really firmly hold to an opinion, how can you have reconciliation if two are equally firm and immovable? One of you has to die. Not physically. <laughs> well, you have to die. I'm sorry, dear. Um, but you have to die to yourself. If anyone would be a disciple of mine, he must take up his cross daily and deny himself and follow after me. That's the condition of being a disciple. That's a condition. That's not the end result. That's the beginning. These, Jesus did not read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. He's like, oh, you want to follow me? Great. Hate your own life, then come follow me. And once you do that, I'll give you more than you could ever imagine. But this is, this is, the, this is the ante, right? This is the table stakes. And so this is the important thing. This is why we're sacramentalizing marriage, because we need help to carry our crosses. And we need to help our spouses carry their crosses, because all of us are the walking wounded for the love of Christ. We all have burdens, sins, wounds that we wish we didn't have. We all do. No one is so perfect. Right? Although I, sometimes I do feel like marriage, what Bill Burr has this great line of comedian. He's like, why is it that after all these years of marriage, I'm the only one we're working on? As if she's perfect, but we're still working on me, right? Which I think is hysterical and very close to the truth. But the reality is two things. We are both imperfect because we're not God. And when you look to your spouse to make you perfectly happy, you're asking your spouse to be God to you. You are my fulfillment, my desire, my all. You complete me. Well, that's not entirely true. Your spouse is part of God's plan to give you that joy and happiness and completion. But ultimately, only God satisfies. So if you look to your spouse and say, you must make me perfectly happy. My entire happiness is in your hands. Number one, you're cheating yourself. And number two, you're cheating them. But if you realize you're both imperfect and you realize that I can carry my cross and you aren't my cross. A friend of mine is a Catholic speaker. Her husband uh, struggled with a lot of demons growing up. And uh, she used to pray all the time. And he, he doesn't believe in God or anything like that. And so she would be like, oh, my husband, he's my cross. He's my cross. One day she had her spiritual director. And she's like, if your spouse is your cross, you're doing it wrong. Help your spouse carry their cross. And she it totally changed her marriage. Help your spouse carry her cross or his cross. That takes grace and self-denial. As Chess, uh, what's his name, Churchill said, your yes is only as good as your no's, right? You being able to deny yourself makes you a gift of yourself to your beloved. 1616, 16. this is what the Apostle Paul makes clear when he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. Adding at once, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two become one. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ and the church. This is the high theology of St. Paul in Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. What did Christ do? He died for the church. He gave all to the church. Love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Husbands, love your wives all the way to death. Wives, respect them. Husbands, die for them, right? That's the plan. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ and the church. 16, 17. 
And we're going to talk about that love respect thing later. The entire Christian life bears the mark of the spousal love of Christ and the church. Already, baptism, the entry into the people of God, is a nuptial mystery. So now we're looking at the sacraments as signs of this marital meaning. It is, so to speak, the nuptial bath which precedes the wedding feast, the Eucharist. Now, I don't know about y'all. I took a shower before I got married. That was about it. I don't think the Double Tree Hotel would count as a nuptial bath, right? I did. Oh, yes, I'm here in the nuptial bath. There's a tub of milk and a heart-shaped thing. No, that's not what happened. But ancient Jewish wedding feasts were a sight to behold. Traditionally, there were seven days. The husband and wife-to-be were crowned as king and queen. The whole town which would probably be your extended family and relatives, your whole clan or tribe, right, would come to this. Potentially hundreds of people could be there, and your family was responsible for feeding and, and boozing up the wedding guests. So Jesus shows up and brings his disciples, a handful of disciples that he took from John the Baptist, goes up to Cana, crashes the wedding feast, probably because he brought some new disciples. They didn't have enough booze to go around, the wine, and they ran out. And the, 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 the head steward of the feast is like, uh-oh, we just ran out of wine, and we still got a full day of partying ahead, right? So Mary comes up, a mother ever watchful, comes up to her son and says, son, they have no more wine. And he looks at her and says, woman, what is this between you and me? My hour has not yet come. Hour in John's gospel is a motif. It always points to the cross. My hour hasn't come. And the woman, Mary, just looks at him and then looks at the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. So he takes the stone jars that Jews use for ceremonial washings. They wash on the third day and on the seventh day to ritually prepare themselves for the wedding rite. So this is dirty water <laughs> that people have washed their hands ritually, oh, the whole crowd, for seven days. And there were six jo uh, stone jars that held gallons and gallons of it. So then he walks over and he says, and he turns the water into wine. And the chief steward, the best part is, the best part is a parenthetical comment in the Gospel of John, chapter two, where it says, um, "It says now the steward took took some of the wine to the chief steward, and the chief steward drank of it, not knowing where the wine had come." And then in parentheses it says, "Although the servant knew," as if he's like, "Oh, this nasty!" And then he gives it to the guy, and the guy drinks it, and he's like, oh. "And then the guy exclaims, why did you serve the best wine last?'" You give the best wine at the beginning. Then when people have drunk freely, then you serve the inferior. But you have saved the best for last. Why is that so, that story? Why did John, of all the things Jesus did, John at the end of his gospel says, you can fill the whole world with books recording the deeds of Jesus. But these were chosen so that you might believe. Right? Why this wedding be? Why this, hey, I'm for my next trick. No, that's not what's happening. The old, dirty, ritual water is not just Moses in the Old Testament. It's our sin. It's what we bring to the table. But our yes, do whatever he tells you, allows Christ to make, and this is perennially the sign of the gospel, the new wine. This is the new wine. This is what Christ does with the dirty jars of water that we bring him called ourselves. And Christ can turn you into the new wine in your marriage. In fact, there's a marriage curriculum that's out called the new wine. And it's just to help couples live from the cross, not just go to Mass on Sunday for an hour. See, this is the problem. So many Christians think what it means to be a Christian is I just pray, pay, and obey, right? I show up at Mass, I do my hour. Let's be honest, it's St. Anthony's an hour and a half, right? I go to Mass on Sundays, I check the box, check the box, and that's it. But we are the walking wounded. We are the ones with the dirty water. We're the ones that, if we're honest with ourselves, we need healing just as much as our spouse or future spouse or whatever it might be. And so when we enter this, I want you to know that the grace is there and that even if your baptism, this nuptial arrangement is there for you to purify yourselves. You went into the water of baptism. You died to yourself. You came out of that waters. You rose to new life. That's the point. That's the nuptial bath. The Jewish wedding feast would end with the uh, families of the bride and the groom placing after the marriage rite would occur. They would place them in chairs and crown them with reeds and they would lift them up and they would call them the king and the queen and they would escort them to the outside of the of the party area, usually on the outside of town. And there is a hopa, a wedding tent. And it's set up and adorned by the probably the bridesmaids, what we would call bridesmaids, uh, adorned right there for the couple to consummate their marriage. And then the rest of the party, they then leave 
the couple alone. And typically the wedding dress, right? Back then, this is why women wear veils, is because the wedding dress was composed of many veils, right? Many pieces of layered fabric over one another. And this is the funny thing. The Greek word for what takes place inside that wedding tent, I think is hilarious. It's the apocalypse. The apocalypse. What does that mean? In Greek, it means the unveiling, the removing of the veils. That takes place within the wedding tent, the revelation. The last book of the Bible is called the apocalypse or revelations. To reveal means to unveil, right? And so the woman unveils herself to the man, and there the two become one flesh physically because they've already been one flesh spiritually, or they've already been one spiritually. And so sex becomes, within the marital covenant, the ratification of the oaths that you swore. I am yours and you are mine. It's interesting that when couples today write their own vows, almost without exception, the vows that they write talk about uh, their love in that moment. I love you so much. You're great. I love your eyes. You're wonderful. But when you look at the church's vows, and Mary has poured forth all this time and effort going through the, the vows and setting it all up for the uh, convalidation ceremonies, when you look at the church's vows, they are not a pledge of current love because that's not what a vow does. It's consent, but a pledge of future constancy, future love. Right? For better or for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health. True story. Father Tom flew up to St. Louis. I'm now getting married to my bride, Shannon. I'm standing up on the altar. I'm crying a little bit. I had something in my eye. The air conditioner was dirty. Um, and I'm up there and I'm holding her hand, right? And we're saying the things and we're doing the vows. And the priest says, Father Tom flew up. He said, Repeat after me, Shannon. Okay. And he said, I, Shannon, take you, Michael, to be my husband, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, for better, for worse, in health and in sickness, for richer or for poorer. My wife goes, for better and for worse, in sickness and in health, for richer and for poorer. And she literally mumbled, and for poorer, as a joke, during our wedding vows at the wedding. And I was like, God, I am so lucky. Right. And she is unlucky because she married a guy who works for the church. So whoopsie. So in that right right there, the vows make the thing, but the, the, the conjugal love ratifies with the two becoming one flesh. Preceding the one fleshman, right, preceding the act, what we call the marital act, right, preceding that is the spiritual act of communion. I am yours and you are mine. In fact, my wedding ring in Hebrew says, I am my beloved's and he is mine, right? That movement, Pope, uh, uh, Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, the venerable, he said, um, love knows only two words, you and always, you and always, you sometimes, right? That doesn't sound like love, you occasionally, right? You and some others always, right? That, that doesn't sound like love. And so the heart of what we're doing is we're trying to show that this, this nuptial mystery is rooted in the whole Christian life. So to speak, the nuptial bath which precedes the wedding feast, the Eucharist. The Christian marriage, Christian marriage in its turn, becomes an efficacious sign, wow, there it is again, the sacrament of the covenant of Christ in the church. Since it signifies and communicates grace, marriage between baptized persons is a true sacrament of the new covenant, okay? It's a true sacrament of the new covenant. And I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna end there because I love talking and can keep going. We're gonna end there, but you're gonna have homework. Mary, do you have the discussion questions? I don't have those up here. Yes, they should have picked them up. Okay, you should have picked them up. So what I want you all to do is to finish reading The Family in God's Plan, okay, which is paragraphs 2201 all the way to 2379, 2379. This now, here's the difference. These were all 1600s. That's because this came from the second part of the catechism on the sacrament, celebrating the sacrament. So if you were to open up a catechism, you go to the second part, the seven sacraments, find the sacrament matrimony, you'll find the exact same thing that we covered. However, if you go to the third part, that's on Christian morality, and you look up the nature and meaning of the family, the family and God's plan, the family now, it'll go through and start introducing you to moral theology. Before, what we were reading was sacramental theology. 
Now we're going into moral theology. And you're going to realize, especially when you get to that back page, it's going to talk about sexual and medical ethics. It's going to introduce this stuff. Take it slow, read through it, and come back at me on Wednesday with any questions. Email me any questions. I'm a nerd for this stuff. I want to help you out. Let's close in prayer. Is that okay? No, freak. I leave work at work. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Good deal. And I'll send you the link to this terrible video. But thank God it's on YouTube. Double speed, right? Beep, boop, boop. Double speed. What's your wife's name? Maria. Maria. I hope you enjoyed looking at my chin this whole time. God bless you. <laughs> That's what happens when it's on a lower. I, uh, one time, I used to have it, like, when I would do this in, in some of the class, I would have it on this podium. But it's like, it's like, you're just, it's all nostrils all the time. So I hope a little space would help. Hope a little space would help. Sorry, Maria. <laughs> She's in Singapore, sentence. right? She's in Singapore right yeah. now? Singapore. That's that's on my bucket list. Singapore is on my bucket list. Well, we're moving this. So You're moving there. So I'm going to come and visit you. Yeah. <laughs> well, nice yeah, get the kids. I have four kids. <laughs> oh, I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> oh, I am not above that. Um, okay. Let's, uh, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Now, this is what I want you to do. This is helpful when we pray. For many Catholics, we were not really taught how to pray, only how to repeat. So I'm going to help you pray in different ways. I love my uh, memorized prayers and pray them all the time. But I want you right now, um, what we're going to do is I just want you to think of something about your beloved that you love. Just think of something in your past, your history, um, something that they do today. Some of you might be harder than others. I want you to just picture the reason why. You're here. Just think about it. Don't look at me. I know it's hard. I am eye candy, but uh, just picture why, what do I love about this person as we pray? In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus Christ, you're the eternal Son of God. We bless you. We praise you. We adore you. And we thank you, Jesus. We want to get rid of all entitlement, which says the world owes me. And we want to replace our entitlement with gratitude, which says I'm thankful for all that I have. Jesus, I am thankful for your death and resurrection. I am thankful for you calling me friend and calling me into communion with you by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I'm thankful that you have directed my life to this point. Even the hardships, Lord, have made me who I am. So I come before you, Jesus, right now with my cross, with my wounds, with my joys, and with my dreams. And I want to just thank you, Lord Jesus for the person you have put in my life. You know them better than I do, and you love them deeper than I ever could. But Jesus, by my love for you and your love for me, may it refine how I am a spouse to this person. May your grace flood my mind, my heart, my body, my soul, our circumstances, our finances, our communication, everything that makes us, us. Permeate the whole thing with your most Holy Spirit. And Mother Mary, we ask you, all of our mothers here, we ask you, our sweet lady, to intercede for us to your son, as you did for the couple at the wedding feast of Cana, that we might have not just a true and sacramental union, but a joyful one, a healing one, a hopeful one, one filled with the love of Christ, crucified and risen. Jesus, in your matchless name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so next week, your homework is the family and God's plan and the discussion questions that Mary gave. Right? They're in the back. Yes. I will also email them out uh, tomorrow or Friday so that you can have them Boop. digitally if you want.